Hello. Good to see folks. Hey, JD. Glad you're here. Hi. Glad to be here. Um, see, we have Pato and Melissa. Glad you're here. Hey, Sarah. Knocking it out of the park. The work. Hi, Luce. How are you, my darling? I'm good. I'm good. Had a productive week. You know, met a couple of people that, you know, are helping me along my way. And okay. I'm going to my stepson's house next week for Thanksgiving. So oh. I haven't seen them in forever. And then I'll be spending the night. Allie and I will be spending the night. So I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, I'm so glad you'll be able to be with them. Yes. Uh, How are you? Good. Um, um, busy. <laughs> Very busy. Um, all right. Just letting some folks in uh, as we're getting settled. Um, hey, Fiona. Glad to see you. Hi. Um, thanks for having us. Totally. I'm so stoked um thank you yes this is going to be great friends um this conversation i had the um the the uh fortunate luck to be invited to and stumbled into the um virtual launch party for the book last week and i cried and like I, you know I, I always expect to cry a little bit but it was just this like being able to be with our um a group of uh, folks who've been living with long COVID and just people who under who just like our family, this like this community, like the larger part of our family and hearing people uh, do readings from the, the book and their chapters and their own voice, just really powerful stuff. And then also just really doing a lot for my brain because we talk, you know, we are sharing our stories of COVID loss long COVID intersection of those things, but just thinking about how it's so rare to kind of be able to have a mirror of like the impact of us sharing our stories are. And there's just something really special about our siblings and long COVID storytellers and being able to um, have that sort of solidarity and community. So I'm excited for tonight's um, discussion with Fiona and Pato and JD. Um, good to see you, DJ and Jeffrey. So good to see you. Um, great question. Jeffrey asked, uh, sent me an email with a a uh, link to a New York Times article that came out in Style Magazine uh, that was about memorials. And um, it was like, why aren't we being featured in this? Great question, Jeffrey. Um, we are reaching out to the reporter to let them know that, uh, or let uh, inform them about our memorial work and hopefully can make sure that we're on their radar going forward. But that also just kind of goes in uh, line with Oh, hey, Jackie. And look, I think those are Pikachus, right? I love it. Um, um, just goes in line with sort of this, you know, next steps of our memorial work is uh, continuing to talk to you, everyone, um, everywhere about it. And I practiced that today with sharing, I was on a call with some colleagues in the world of um, social justice, today. Uh, JD and Pato were both there. And um, during one of our breaks, I made everyone look at the uh, some of the COVID memorial visual visuals that we have. Um, so we're going to get started in a couple of minutes. I think we got folks from their waiting room and just some stuff, stuff at the top of the hour as we're all getting settled. Um, for folks who may not know who I am, my name is Kristen Urquiza. I'm the co-founder of Marked by COVID, um, which is working for both pandemic justice as well as remembrance. And the community meeting that we have tonight is one of Marked by COVID's sort of hallmark offerings and being a space for people who are living um, with COVID grief, long COVID, with the financial fallout, uh, the way that we handled the pandemic, 
the intersection of all of those issues come together on a weekly basis, um, have different types of programming, but then also use the sp space for building community, connecting on some of our national priorities that we're working on together as a movement in the advocacy and memorialization space, and also just really be able to witness one another, um, witness the struggle that is um, trying to stay alive in an active pandemic, um, and the struggle of navigating um, this really challenging and consistent landscape, uh, that consistently moving landscape of um, COVID uh, grief um, and pandemic uh, work. So um, that's a little bit more about who we are. And uh, tonight we have three special guests with us. But before um, we get to the meat of our time together, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things that I know have happened this week that might be on people's minds and holding heavy um, right now. Um, you know, in addition to the fact that we are still losing hundreds of people a day, um, of which I have been playing closer to attention to Alex uh, Goldstein, our guest speaker's last week's uh, Twitter feed at Faces of COVID. Um, and so many of those faces that we're seeing are folks that passed three, 10, 12 days ago. So in addition to still living, losing far too many people a day to COVID, um, I know that there was a incredibly unnerving and unacceptable vote by the Senate to declare the pandemic over. And whether or not that is just performative or goes to the House, or even if Biden says he would veto it, the fact that, you know, in the wake of the elections that and, and many Democratic senators um, voting yes on that just goes to show the upward battle that we have in really securing the type of recognition that our community deserves because we are actively being um, downplayed and ignored and uh, attempting to be erased, um, which is why this space and the spaces I get to be in where we talk about COVID and long COVID are so special um, and radical and important to ensuring that our lived experience and the experience that we are building together is not swept under the rug. Um, in good news this past week, the Biden administration did request um, funding uh, for the pandemic. Uh, it's uh, much lower than what um, is needed, but uh, that was a nod in um, the good sort of category of happenings around uh, the country. Um, after our chat with our guests today, we are going to spend a chunk of our time, uh, the rest of our time, uh, talking about our COVID Memorial Day legislation and um, the task force of folks in our community that are working to advance um, that legislation. And I just want to, at the top of the hour, say that I'm so incredibly um, awestruck by the leadership of uh, Sarah from Wisconsin, Sarah with the Green Bus, um, Monica from Minnesota, uh, Marie and Tara, as well as others across the country who have helped over subsequent push or previous pushes, but they just started doing outreach this week and they already have, I think, four, if not five meetings scheduled in the next few days. So uh, meetings with uh, members of Congress to, to talk about our community and our need and our legislation for COVID Memorial Day. So excellent work team there. Yeah. Um, so, um, without further ado, uh, we're going to transition into the, um, uh, long COVID survival guide. We are, um, absolutely delighted, um, to have Pato Hebert, JD Davis, and Fiona Lowenstein with us today. Um, I have met these three over the course of my journey. Uh, Fiona was one of the first people uh, that I met. And I remember uh, being with them in a sort of a, a Biden equity task force meeting and thinking them 
right them. I think I interviewed with them before, but I, I, I need to make sure this one doesn't fall off my radar. Um, and Fiona is the editor of this incredible book that just came out and that we're going to hear some readings from today and have some discussion around. So I, I'm going to turn it over to Fiona and the team to share uh, with us. And as we are transitioning, if folks uh, want to um, share anything in the chat um, for our guests or what happened this week uh, is, is happening this week, feel free to do so. Fiona? Thank you so much, Kristen. And um, it's really an honor to be here. I've come to a couple of these community meetings and they are just, it's such a loving and vibrant space. And the, I, I'm recognizing some faces also that I saw at Hollywood Forever uh, a couple weeks ago. And just the work that you all do is, hi, <laughs> I'm seeing Lucy, it's good to see you. Um, I, I Just the work that you do, it, it really, it's it embodies COVID activism and um, the solidarity that has been built between your group and folks uh, living with long COVID is really I mean it, it gives me hope um, gives me hope for the future so um, I'm excited to be here today with the long COVID survival guide this is you can see mine is all marked up and I encourage you to do that to yours too uh, if and when you get a copy um, we're going to be talking a little bit today about the long legacy of peer support from HIV AIDS through long COVID. Um, and so I'm going to be reading a short excerpt of my introduction. And before I dive in, um, I want to just give a little bit of context um, on, on myself and kind of where I'm positioned um, between these movements. Um, I was born at the tail end of 1993 in New York City in a community with, with high rates of HIV. Um, and I very much grew up in the legacy of one of the most powerful peer-to-peer -peer information sharing and advocacy movements. And I think in some ways took that for granted. And I think in other ways that experience and other formative experiences uh, in my early life really shaped my approach to setting up the Body Politic COVID-19 support group and creating this book project. But it took reading chapters like Pato's and JD's um, and writing my own introduction to this book, which of course I did at the last minute because... <laughs> that is how things happen sometimes, to realize that the full influence of, of that movement. So I'm going to read a little bit from my introduction where I talk about that. If you have ever had a serious illness or have cared for someone with a serious illness, you may be aware that there's a range of people who see pain, fear, and sickness and attempt to provide answers. Some of these people are medical professionals trying to do their job. Others are well-meaning health or wellness enthusiasts. Some are just out to capitalize on your experience or scam you. Not all advice is created equal. When we got sick, there were no COVID experts. I know now that there were people with post-viral and infection-initiated chronic illnesses like ME-CFS who knew that the pandemic would likely result in a mass disabling event and who could speak to the experience of living with a complex, multi-systemic chronic illness. These people and the providers and researchers who have worked with them would eventually become a source of vital information. But back in March of 2020, all that I knew was that no one, not the doctors treating me, not the international or federal health agencies, not even the infectious disease experts talking on CNN could explain what was happening to my body. I could keep waiting around for them to find answers or at the very least acknowledge my pain, or I could learn from others who have been neglected or ignored by medicine and science and crowdsource the information myself. I wasn't a scientist, hell, I'd been a history major, but it turned out that history degree would come in handy. As soon as I had enough energy to open my laptop, I started digging around for old college syllabi, rereading first person accounts of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, ACT UP and other activist groups that provided peer-to-peer -peer support, care, and knowledge gathering during the HIV AIDS epidemic. I reread a book about people who taught themselves how to perform abortions before they were legal and paged through old photos of medical clinics run by the Black Panthers. I'd analyzed all these texts in school, but reading them felt different this time. A common theme was emerging. If you think no one cares about you, you might be right, and you might need to do it yourself. This book is authored primarily by people who have experienced long COVID. Most are still living with the illness. Their professional and personal backgrounds are diverse. Some have degrees in science or medicine. Others are professional writers, educators, or activists. 
but their most important qualification is their lived experience. Having reported closely on long COVID since it first emerged, I can tell you that it was the actions of long haulers themselves that triggered a global response to this illness. Nearly every piece of knowledge we have gained about this disease, as well as every attempt to provide systemic support, would not exist without the leadership and input of long COVID patients. We are the reason it has a name, a disease classification code, interim guidance, dedicated clinics, a page on the CDC website, and funded research. Obviously, there are also a lot of allies outside of our lived experience, journalists, scientists, and medical professionals, to name a few, who have raised awareness and carefully listened to our stories, using them to inform scientific research and sometimes making major breakthroughs. We wouldn't be where we are today without them. But a guidebook on long COVID must be authored by those who have experienced it firsthand, and ideally a diverse group given the varying disease presentations and experiences that can characterize this illness. Otherwise, we are rewriting history, plagiarizing ideas, and honestly, likely to get a lot wrong. That's because patients have been able to learn about long COVID for longer and from a much more intimate vantage point than anyone else. From day one in the support group, I was learning. I learned from people experiencing symptoms for the first time and from people with years of experiencing managing chronic illnesses. We learned together. All you need is one person who truly understands what you're going through and believes you. For me, that person was my friend Sabrina. Then it was 10,000 strangers on the internet. Today, it is a wide network that includes providers, health experts, disability justice advocates, and friends and family. You may not be fortunate to have such a network yet, and that's common. Long COVID is still widely misunderstood. I hope this book can be the start of such a network for you. I hope it envelops you in a warm hug of words that resonate with your experience and promises you that at bare minimum, you are believed, your life matters, and you are certainly not alone. And yes, you are part of my 10,000 friends on the internet. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. I am going to turn it over to JD now, who is going to read an excerpt from their incredible chapter, which was co-authored with Nana Kana. JD, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's it's really great to be here with you all. I've wanted to come to these meetings, but honestly, as a person with fatigue on the East Coast, I start sort of conking out the service this time of night. So it's it's good to be here, and and uh, hopefully I'll be able to make it through. Um, but I really, I love Marked by COVID and just thinking of the community supporting each other um, helps me feel supported. Um, and um, so I, I, yeah, I, I send um, much uh, regards uh, from Nana Kano, who is the co-author of this chapter with me. Um, she wishes she could be here today, but she's, I think, actually on a flight as we speak, so she can't be. Um, our chapter is actually the, the final one in the book bringing it on home, um, it's called Such a Powerful Love, Disabled and Chronically Ill People and Our Long Fight for Justice. Um, Nana is the co-founder of, is the, the founding executive director of the US Positive Women's Network, which is a national network of women and people of trans experience who are living with HIV. And we've worked together for many years. So I'm gonna read a, a few segments from my part. I've been chronically ill my whole life, really, though my family and I never named it as such in part because nothing was severe or life-threatening. Whatever may be the root cause, I have a strange immune system that's too active in some ways and not vigilant enough in others. When I look back now, I can see how frequent bouts of, of viral and bacterial infections and relentless allergies change so many things about my life and relationships, like frequently missing school. I can now see how being a sickly kid heightened the feelings of difference and feeling of judgment a fear of judgment I carried as someone who was already one of the few Jews in the community and who was puzzled by gender expectations I didn't really identify with. I came into the HIV activist group ACT UP when I was finishing college in 1990. I was starting to have glimmers of queerness in myself, realizing what I had long suppressed. And I was trying to find a way to do good in the world around me. Then my friend Mike brought me to an ACT UP meeting and I was put to work. There wasn't a question about whether to center the people who were most effective because people living with HIV had started the group. It was an activist group that did things, but really at its heart, it was a community and a home. So that's always, always stayed with me. For the first time in my life, I was around people for whom illness was the norm, not the exception. And in a way, difference itself was the norm. 
We were a crew of sick people and allies, queer people, current and former drug users, and others drawn together by a virus and a commitment to doing all we could to save ourselves, our loved ones, and our friends. The mentorship was incredible. I have a clear memory of Kiyoshi Karamiya, who came to the HIV movement after a long history in the civil rights and gay liberation movements, teaching us how when someone's in the hospital, they need clean sheets, you just go and you find the sheets and you bring them to the room. You get assistance if the hospital staff has time, but you always relate with compassion and practicality to both the hospital staff and the patient in the room. They're all on the team and they're all to be treated as if they're in it together with common cause. And we just do what we needed to do. Kiyoshi would be sitting next to Dr. Fauci one day and the next he'd be in the hospital making sure someone had ice chips or whatever it was. You just did what needed to be done. When we come together as people facing a disease or health challenge across our different communities and life experiences, we can share information and approaches to help us all. In the history of the HIV pandemic, people who came together in the activist group ACT UP include a whole bunch of lesbians who've been a part of the women's health movement, which was about a very embodied understanding of our own bodies. They had the experience of literally taking matters in their own hands, using speculums and flashlights to learn what their cervixes look like, while at the same time critiquing how medical establishments talked about gender, women, reproduction, and sex. And so this sort of do-it-yourself DIY practice from which we all can learn about our bodies and health, even as we work to challenge bias and stigma in the healthcare system, came to ACT UP, allowing people of all genders to feel more confident in speaking up about what our bodies needed. Today, people are sharing a range of experiences within patient-led long COVID groups to help care for ourselves and one another. I see what people are bringing to it, even with the pandemic constraints many have. I realize, realize it from the intense HIV connection, and now I see it with people living with long COVID. As I've said, I've been chronically ill for a long time, and for the last 15 years, that's included experiencing some scarier symptoms, lasting disability, and a range of diagnoses that now many people with long COVID are getting. And having had COVID twice now, some of my conditions became worse thanks to long COVID. When I came to the body politics support group, I actually learned from people with long COVID about mast cell activation syndrome and a whole new range of treatments I could try. This was never discussed with me by my myriad specialists I've seen over the years. And it's been rapidly and deeply helpful in reducing my pain, helping my digestion and zapping my brain fog. So much I've been able to resume full-time work for the first time in years, which I've done now starting the strategies for high impact and our network for long COVID justice. In return, I've shared about less common treatments for fatigue that I found helpful as a person with ME-CFS. That's the kind of magic that happens in patient-led movements. Quality of life is such a deep thing and it can be so distant and overlooked in medical care. At its core, it's about what's meaningful to each person. When we have a complex chronic illness, we often don't get much support in formal medical settings to think through and identify for ourselves what's most important. For years, I experienced a queasy dizziness that none of my providers wanted to prioritize, but I came to realize it was one of the most persistent factors in my life, affecting my ability to work, to parent, and to tend to my emotional wellness. Eventually, I started repeatedly demanding referrals to those who might be able to help, and I was referred to a vestibular rehab center. Within weeks, the dizziness was mostly gone, and my life just felt so much more like my own again. But if I'd never spoken or pushed back against the answers I was repeatedly being given, I never would have experienced that improvement in my quality of life. My ability to be vocal and persistent about my priorities like this is because of the loving mentorship of my role models in health justice, particularly women living with HIV, trans people, and people with complex chronic conditions like ME. It's like having an invisible cheerleading squad inside me that keeps pushing for what I need so I don't feel alone. Lastly, I wanna talk about disability justice because I hope it'll be baked into the DNA of long COVID advocacy in ways that didn't happen with HIV, where there's a distancing, even an othering about disability. For years, I've heard people with HIV say, but we're not disabled, as if a call for recognition of their worth in humanity. Then in the 2020 film Crip Camp, which was otherwise so inspiring, one of the disability rights protest leaders says, but we're not sick on the mic seeking to do the same thing. So these roots are long and gnarly. Those disability rights activists fought for and won legal protections and recognition of disabled people. But we know that having theoretical rights doesn't dismantle injustices of white supremacy, gender bias, and anti-immigrant practices that affect so many disabled people. So now disability justice 
which was first named by a collective of queer disabled people of color called Sins Invalid, is moving us beyond rights to liberation. With practices and principles that are deeply intersectional, rooted in and dedicated to the worthiness of all. But it doesn't mean the HIV community has followed that same trajectory. Even though it's a health justice movement, there's a lot of stigma about disability in the HIV community, where there's often bias against people who are less healthy and less able-bodied, and often not enough discussion about accessibility. What's happened with HIV under capitalism is that it's not just a virus or a disease, it's a market, a huge market. And honestly, long COVID will be too. The messaging from the market and from the government is that people with HIV should focus on wellness and health, which are great things to have access to when you're told you're likely to have a death sentence. But when the first effective combination treatment for HIV emerged, the photos in the ads were often of mountain hikers and athletic bikers, even though that wasn't feasible and isn't feasible for many people, even though they got a life-saving treatment. People are encouraged to think of themselves as successfully living with conditions or health challenges in opposition to disability, not as disabled people successfully finding our way in a biased and inaccessible society that fears and shames sickness. And this is extra thorny when we realize that many people with long COVID may be chronically ill and disabled pre-pandemic. For those with us for whom that is true, will our experiences be seen as less important than those newly disabled? or sick from long COVID. To do well is to repudiate disability. An actual illness is a sign of weakness, failure, or personal decision-making gone awry. So it makes even more challenging to find that common cause, even though the most inevitable thing that will happen to all of us, if we're lucky, is that we will age, we will become chronically ill, and we will be living with disabilities or disabled. But that is seen as the problem in this ableist society. So, in the early days of the HIV movement, it was concurrent with the super powerful direct action movement of disabled people that won the Americans with Disability Act, the ADA, that people with HIV have much benefited from. I feel our communities have been pushed apart from each other. Yes, because of funding, and also because it's the marketing of ableism that we're all individuals striving for this thing called wellness, and thus even our health movements can become incredibly ableist. Within COVID, long COVID, this ableist framework will show up as stigma for those who don't quote unquote recover, as if it's a mark of personal failing. We're gonna see how false differences or small differences or misinterpreted, exaggerated differences will play into judgment about who's doing the right thing to fix their long COVID and being productive and working at it and who's not. Who's to blame when we talk about when we say someone fails a treatment? That's not it, the treatment fails you. Often the whole system fails you when it comes to rampant anti-Blackness and other forms of bias in healthcare. Complex chronic conditions are so underfunded and marginalized in medicine that even white people with private insurance often can't get a diagnosis or good care a lot of the time. But it's much harder for Black and Brown people to even find out they have a complex chronic condition, which is also fed by and further furthers destructive myths like ME being supposedly a privileged white women's disease. I've seen similar misguided assumptions made about long COVID. We're neither failures for being sick, nor guilty or to blame for getting a health condition. That's the importance of the HIV activist slogan, all people with HIV are innocent. There was a whole innocent victim message about babies born with HIV, for example. And we need to say that all people living with HIV are innocent in terms of deserving healthcare and rights. I hope people with long COVID reading this conversation know that this sort of blame is entirely misplaced. And if they witness or experience it, they can speak or write about why this is problematic and can harm all of us. Once you start drawing lines between deserving and undeserving, we're all at risk of exclusion and harm. Thank you. Thanks. I know we have Pato. Pato is going to read. <laughs> yeah, thank you, JD. Can you all hear me okay, despite my mitigation measures? Okay. Uh, I just want to thank Kristen and Christine for all the work that you do with Marked by COVID and the space you create for us to mourn and connect and to survive. And I want to sing Fiona's praises and give thanks for their vision, diligence, and care that make this book possible. It's just such a gift to be part of this community and this moment in our shared history. Two weeks ago yesterday, I tested and learned that somehow I've been reinfected. 
Ever since I started long hauling, living with long COVID in the spring of 2020, one of my symptoms is that I constantly mix up words. So a few Wednesdays ago, when I went to order medicine to help with this new second infection, <laughs> instead of Paxlovid, it came out Paxlivid. And I howl <laughs> with laughter every time I tell this story because it helps me to counterbalance all of my pseudobulbar tears, another one of my symptoms, and to just keep going, which is what we do together. My chapter in the book is called COVID Can't Be Outpaced, Learning, Pacing, and Radical Rest. And I'll read from a few sections. It's about the vital practice of pacing, which is a self-management practice. And it's a strategy for managing our activity. As chronically ill people, we pace ourselves so that we, we're active when we're able and we rest when we're tired. We plan extra rest ahead of or after strenuous activities. Rest and pacing are something I've done a lot during these recent weeks of once again being in quarantine. So from my chapter on pacing, I'll read from this first section, which is called Stop, Rest, Pace. I've had to learn that recalibration is more important than rigid notions of recuperation. I've had to recalibrate my habits, my expectations, my ways of being. I've had to learn to pace. I haven't always understood the rhythms of pacing and its vital importance for long haulers. For guidance, I turn to the wisdom of other warriors with chronic illness and the work of ME Action, an advocacy group and global movement for health justice. Collective organizing had first introduced me to the efforts of ME Action. The ME in their name is not a shouting, all caps, individual self, of course, but rather the shorthand for myalgic encephalomyelitis, a complex illness that can cause extreme fatigue that does not simply improve with rest. I learned about ME Action through the dynamic organizing that's happening between communities of ME, COVID, HIV, and disability activists. Even though our more coordinated efforts are early in the early years of gaining greater momentum and shared traction, we're not mutually exclusive communities. People living with chronic illness compare notes on gaslighting, stigma, workplace or dating challenges, strategies for advocacy and policy change. See how Kristen opened the meeting this week, um, like every week, giving updates about where we're at, right, each week. I first wrote R in place of our, part of how I mix up words with my neurological condition. And it's ironic given that I find meaning in my relationship with others. I have tools for grappling with long hauling because I've been shaped by organizing, learning and playing with others. I'm the political progeny of decades of HIV organizing, primarily with queer communities of color. This work has taught me about harm reduction and doula -ing sex positivity and strength-based approaches to community and care instead of thinking of ourselves as deficient, we understand ourselves as amazing if also living with chronic illness, sometimes because we're living with chronic illness and we survive in these vibrant ways. It's also blessed me by bringing countless amazing, resilient, brilliant, courageous, irreverent, everyday folks, activists and organizers to my life. Some of these people are also living with ME or other chronic illnesses and disabilities. The ME, the ME community knows all about fatigue and pacing, gaslighting by healthcare providers and loved ones alike, and the urgent need for high quality research, treatment, resources, and mobilization. ME Action's latest and ongoing campaign astutely links some of the bodily symptoms and the structural conditions in our culture that are shared between living with MECFS and long hauling with COVID. This aligned understanding of daily survival skills, community building and advocacy strategies is invaluable, as is their call to tell those with long COVID to stop, rest, pace. Since learning of this campaign, I've been trying to enact its guiding wisdom in my daily life. This gave me the idea to structure the essay around the practices of stop, rest and pace with an eye toward naming some of what's been helpful and some of what's been really hard for me. I'm from another section called Two Ambulance Town, Animo. I feel like a sick person, one of my students says to me during office hours. You are, 
I say simply, directly, lovingly, with encouragement and solidarity, we are. From our very first advisement session last September, we've talked together about being long haulers. It's the new year and we're still talking about silence and isolation, not wanting to worry or burden loved ones, the impossibility and harm of trying to carry it all alone, the power of sharing. This student city of 56,000 people in the global south only has two ambulances. So when their lungs started shutting down and they called for emergency transport to the hospital, it took three hours for the, hot, for the ambulance to arrive at their home. I thought I was going to die, they say matter of factly, but in a near whisper, I still haven't told my family. This is part of why I write publicly about my messy process with COVID. This is why I started sharing via social media the day after I tested positive and why I haven't ceased. Why the collection you are holding and in which we are meeting matters. Individually, we must always stop and take our breaks. But collectively, we cannot ever stop organizing spaces and paces of care with and for one another. Each of us individually lives in unique and evolving circumstances, and we should always have the right to our respective privacy, process, dignity, but we should never feel like we have to live in isolation to sustain these. And this next and last section I'll share is called Hay Tiempo. Back in the city, I spend some time with a former student now friend. They've got an exciting new job that last week had them running an art fair in Los Angeles. They invite me to come visit the Hollywood Hotel where the fair is staged. We haven't seen each other since before the pandemic. I notice a new tattoo on their wrist. It looks like handwriting, but I can't quite tell. It's dark where we're sitting poolside and my middle-aged eyes aren't so great. My compa tells me a story about visiting the studio of the legendary Mexican photographer, Manuel Alvarez Bravo. And seeing Ay Tiempo, written twice just outside of his darkroom, the place of creative alchemy. Ay Tiempo, there's time. This small and beautiful script appears across their skin in Alvarez Bravo's handwriting, a delicate single line they had inked as a reminder for the frenetic pace of the day to day. As we tend to one another in our spaces of mutual aid, like marked by COVID, our spaces of recalibration and care, what might we dream together? What must we make time for? What might appear here in time? And I'll toss back to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Pato, uh, JD, and Fiona. I am um, just going to spotlight um, the three of you. And um, there's, I want to just make sure you're seeing the gratitude and appreciation in the chat along with the hearts and other gestures folks have shared on their reactions page. Um, Wow, uh, so powerful. Um, I We're going to open it up to questions uh, from folks. Uh, feel free to share things in the chat or raise your hand um, as you are kind of, you know, thinking about what you might want to ask. I will open uh, this up with just um, a question about the the parallels or what feels familiar. Um, about the long COVID movement uh, compared to other health justice movements uh, you've been a part of, and I'm particularly thinking Pato and JD and the HIV AIDS work specifically. Um, what feels different? What are lessons learned or not? Um, we don't mind starting there. Well, I could start by saying, so the, the chapter that uh, Nana and I did, we did as a conversation. So I was sort of skipping her parts and doing a sort of monologue that was actually a dialogue. And so one part that got skipped is we both talk about how much an organization named World meant to us and the difference it made to us. And that was women organized to respond to life-threatening diseases. 
And World was started by a woman, Rebecca Dennison, in the uh, early 90s, I guess, or even late 80s. I don't know, very early on. And they had a newsletter because there wasn't internet. And they had a, a, you know, a folded over photocopied newsletter with this terrible Comic Sans font um, that said, you are not alone. And that was this lifeline that would come in the mail, you know, and, um, and so I learned from women living with HIV at World, even though they were based in Oakland, but I came to meet some in, in person, even though I was on the East Coast, um, and through reading this newsletter, and then they would have retreats, and it was like body politic, but it was, you know, not on Slack, and it was people finding their own way, and, and whereas there was, there was a lot of different support groups or activist groups, there was something very special about World because it was uh, rooted in communities of women who were helping each other with things that other, other groups weren't addressing, like doing permanency planning for your kids. And so there was this special community. And then with Nana and her story, she talks about how she, she tested positive and was totally you know, blown away and did it, it took years to get on treatment and the persistence of a patient educator, a peer educator from World who just sort of was there for her calmly and kept dropping off information and was ready when she was ready to go on treatment. And that's what I feel like I found when I found Body Politic as the, the first group I you know, encountered really early on, I guess when it, around when it started, um, was this feeling not just of like, we have to support each other to get the information and, and figure out what we can do, but also just witnessing each other's realities and, and being there for each other um, really reminded me of what I had seen. Um, and that one thing we write in the chapter is that it's, it's never not important to have this kind of peer support. Even though in HIV now there's treatment, there's funding, there's organizations, there's resources. And in fact, with um, the Network for Long COVID Justice and Strategies for High Impact, we're calling for funding and programs that parallel what we have for HIV in the US and worldwide. Look at everything we've done for HIV and then see if it's available, we can adapt it for uh, long COVID. But you still need the peer support because there's nothing like that. Yeah, I would echo that. And I wanna mind time, Kristen, because I know you have some other questions and we have so much you know, great insight um, in the room of everybody gathered, but I always say that one night can change the course of your life. And we know this from HIV, we know this from pregnancy, we know this from activism. And I went to, I got involved in HIV when I was in my early mid twenties and I was living in a house full of lesbians. One of them was my partner at the time in the San Francisco mission district. And one of my roommates walked down the hall and handed a flyer to me, old school, right? This was before people would send you stuff digitally and put it in my hand and said, you should go to this. And it was a creative writing reading by a group of gay Latino men. And I had never heard men share like that in space, let alone Latinos, let alone queer Latinos. And the poetry and the storytelling and the honesty and the humor and the, the rawness and the richness were totally transformative. And the organizer of that reading who had led a series of writing workshops, I ended up seeing at a couple other of art gatherings over the coming months. And I was new to the city and really shy, but I somehow got up the courage to introduce myself. And he was a really amazing writer named Ricardo Bracho, is an, an amazing writer, and at the time was doing organizing by work, teaching art classes as a way to bring people together, like you all come together here once a week to share stories and hold space for one another. And knowing that it can be really difficult to talk about hard stuff but that something really special happens when we don't only keep it private and when we do that together and that the arts are one way in space that we have to do that. And he found out I was a photographer and somehow convinced me to teach a class on photography to co-teach. Um, and that was my start in HIV. And so one of the similarities I see, Kristen, is that everyday people do amazing things all the time. And we do it by finding each other and working together and playing together, as I think JD and I both read in our chapters. And as you say, Fee, you know, Fiona talks about um, your best friend or one of your close friends, and we just sometimes need that one person to reflect. And I think that it's in coming together that that we often are, are brought into our activism 
or, or deeper into our mourning and grieving and possibly even our growth, you know, that accountability, that community, that care. And so those are some of the things that I'm really moved by in our COVID movements, plural, the different ways that we're organizing to try to make sense of and survive this horror that we're in. And as you reminded us at the top of the hour, Kristen, we're still losing hundreds of people a day. The pandemic's far from over. I mean, I'm wearing a mask to protect the people I'm around right now. It's far from over. Um, I, I do feel like there are, um, I wish that some of the lessons that we've known from HIV and ME had been taken up more fully as we've argued for decades by the government, right? And that our systems were accountable in the ways that I think Fiona and JD laid out really powerfully. That is a lost opportunity on the one hand. On the other hand, that we have HIV medicines and that I was able to get Paxlovid is in part because of the work that HIV activists have done for decades. And the research that we have in virus, uh, but responding to vir viruses through medicine and the ways that we know to support each other when nobody else will do it come out of decades and decades of work. And so I find that both really frustrating that things we've known for a long time aren't taken up more fully and resourced the way we deserve and need. But I also am really encouraged that we keep sharing these lessons and developing the new ones that we need. The COVID memorial is not the AIDS memorial, and yet they're not so different in some ways, right? And so there are these echoes across time. And I'll pause there because I know there's other questions, but there's I feel like there's so much you could say about what's similar, but also what's very, very different in this new moment we're in. Thank you both um, so much. Uh, Fiona, this one's for you. And I know there's been a lot of great uh, questions I think have been answered in the chat. So feel free for others to uh, add there. But I was hoping you can speak a little bit to um, just this sort of intergenerationality um, when putting this book together. And I love that there are um, you know, folks across a whole entire spectrums of, of difference. Um, and if you wouldn't mind sharing a bit about that for you. Yeah, I mean, I I think um, that it was that was a big part of just my experience in in this movement was super early on connecting with and JD has this term that he uses that I love of the elders um, right and elders don't necessarily have to be folks of a certain age bracket but that these are people who have you know dealt with chronic illness for longer than you know some of us who who are newer to that experience um, and so I I had this experience of connecting with elders like. JD and Pato and, uh, you know, Terry, Terry Wilder, who has also been involved in ACT UP um, and has done a lot of HIV AIDS organizing, Jennifer Brea, just folks who were either of older generations or had been in, enmeshed in these communities for longer. And I think that they were really crucial in helping uh, long haulers both uh, connect with uh, kind of resources for our own symptoms and understand our own bodies, but also connect with advocacy opportunities and understand um, some of the pathways that we could take. And so I wanted that to be a part of this book. And so I think JD's chapter is a really great example of that. JD's chapter is the closing chapter of the book. And it's sort of an alternative concept for an advice chapter, because I think a lot of the advice that's shared is sort of advocacy and community building as, as a form of really managing long COVID, right? And finding community and finding advocacy as a way of really finding purpose while, while living with this illness. And I think that's something that a lot of us found. So that was important to me. And I also had experiences earlier in life. Um, I was very much mentored by Barbara Seaman, who was a, a member of the, the women's health movement that JD kind of describes in his chapter. Um, and she was a very important person to me when I was a, a child and a young teenager. And so I, I just feel like I was thinking about that. And I was also thinking about future generations. And so I think this book tries to do three things. It it gives kind of that emotional support that we found in the support group where it tries to do that. It also tries to give the tangible logistical advice, um, which, you know, we're, we're sharing less of that in that con in this conversation, but I've seen some folks asking about that in the chat. There is a lot of that sort of, you know, symptom management advice, potential medications that you can, you know, ask your doctor about tests. You can ask your doctor to run, um, you know, different types, compression socks that you can try, that sort of thing. But it also, I think, just tries to bear witness to our experience because, 
you know, I read a lot of um, personal stories from past health justice movements to try and understand how other people approach these issues. And so I kind of want to provide as well, you know, somewhat of a blueprint or just a guiding path or even, you know, a testimony for future generations that might find themselves in a similar situation. So I think I was thinking about that. I want to recap quickly because there's been some ch chatter. Um, we do have, as I mentioned, there is a lot of tangible advice in the book kind of interwoven with these stories. For folks who are not um, reading a whole lot these days, I very much understand that I'm also not reading as much as I used to. We do have an audio book coming. There's also um, survival tips at the end of every chapter that look a little bit like this. Um, it's basically a grayed out box. So um, if you are not up to reading an entire chapter, you can also check out kind of the survival tips box at the end of each chapter that summarizes the main advice from that chapter. Um, and the other thing, uh, we had a question about mental health. And so I just wanted to summarize a couple of key points from the mental health chapter. This is going to be super brief, but um, uh, that chapter goes a lot into kind of the science of uh, how COVID and long COVID affects uh, the brain, and it can be really helpful to understand that when understanding kind of what to look for in terms of suicidality and just understanding why you might be feeling the way you're feeling. Um, the person who wrote that chapter, Morgan Stevens, also recommends various forms of virtual therapy. We also have a long hauler in the book who talks about text therapy with her therapist, which has been easier for her because of cognitive dysfunction. Um, and Morgan also recommends looking into a CPTSD diagnosis, just understanding what it is. And then something that Pato actually mentions in their chapter as well, that Morgan mentions as well, is just thinking about measuring time differently. Um, measuring time in terms of, Morgan recommends measuring time in terms of weeks or months rather than in terms of days and understanding that that can be a really helpful way to understand progress. Um, so that's a very distilled version of, of what is in that really beautiful chapter by Morgan, but I just wanted to mention it since it's in the chat. <laughs> I see the post-it annotated version. Well, everyone everyone can make their own post-it uh, annotated version. That's that's the goal, to mark it up, share it with your friends, let, let your communities borrow it. Um, and I'll also put a plug in here to request it from your, your local library um, so more people can access it. So that was, I said a ton of things that weren't what you asked, but hopefully I also answered what you asked, Kristen. Yes, um, you did, thank you. Um, and just recognizing the time and knowing that it is uh, late for folks on the East Coast, um, I want to just say, Thank you um, to our guests, and um, we have some more in the agenda, but I uh, want to get let you off the hot spot in case um, you do need to run. I so incredibly appreciate the three of you uh, being here and the other contributors who um, are not uh, with us today. As I said at the top of our time together, I uh, had the pr pleasure of being invited to and the honor of joining um, the book launch, which included even other speak additional speakers, and just uh, a Zoom meeting that just was incredibly powerful to hear, uh, just as we heard um, this journey and this experience that you know too many of us have had, and far too many more of us will have to have because of the decisions that are continuing to be made by our government. So by helping to shine light and give voice, um, we are um, just incredibly grateful. And I know I'm looking forward to reading the book to be able to help support my mother um, in her long COVID journey. And um, please let us know um, whenever and whatever we can continue to do to be by your side um, in this fight because it is a fight for all of our lives and um, there isn't anything more important um, that I see you know, myself spending my time on doing. So thank you all for being here uh, with us today. Could, could I just say one more thing, Kristen, I forgot to mention? Sure. Um, so um, on December 1st, there's gonna be um, a gathering in front of the, well, in the back of the White House um, that is uh, World AIDS Day, but for the first time, there's going to be um, uh, on-site and remote global uh, action for um, coming together across HIV, 
um, COVID, long COVID, and looking at how we're all being sort of put in harm's way by pandemics. So we would love for people to, to be a part of that from wherever you are. I'm going to put a, I don't know if I can make a flyer come into the, um, the uh, chat, but um, I was going to drop a, uh, if it's okay, to drop a um, link where people can get the save the date um, that will send you information about um, different opportunities to be a part uh, wherever you are. So I'm pretty excited about this because it's it's kind of historical, you know, and uniting across all these issues. And I hope everybody can be a part of it. Thank you, JD. And I'll be sure also to put it in our running notes document uh, for folks to also be able to refer back to um, if you want to participate in that in a virtual or in-person way. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, so the second part of our agenda today is uh, reporting back out and connecting on COVID Memorial Day work. Um, I wanna pass it over to Sarah and Monica in a moment, 